My name is Logan Medish, uh, and I run High Caliber History, um, and I was a freshman here 13 years ago. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today is firearms history right here in Fredericksburg. A uh, show of hands, who was aware that there was actually firearms manufacturing done right here in Fredericksburg? A couple of you? Well, yes, that's true. There still is, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, so, but we're going to talk about historic firearms manufacturing, particularly uh, manufacturing that was done during the Revolutionary War. We're going to talk about a few different individuals and a couple different manufacturing firms that were involved in the production. First individual we're going to talk about is a Scotsman by the name of James Hunter. Uh, Mr. Hunter was born 1721. Uh, he was a Scottish immigrant. He came over here uh, and was actually involved in uh, uh, merchant trading and then actually at one point uh, involved in slave trading as well, uh, but permanently settled in Fredericksburg in 1749. And by the 1750s, he had opened up an ironworks, which was a very big deal here in the Fredericksburg area. There were a number of ironworks up and down the Rappahannock uh, area. And so he happened to have one of those large establishments. He was exceptionally successful in that regard. Uh, he had an estate of 6,000 acres. Uh, and uh, uncomfortable though it may be today to look at it, he did own more than 400 slaves. Uh, it's an atrocity um, in today's mindset, but looking at it in his world, in his time, he was a very uh, successful individual. Uh, and then he died in 1784, and he is buried behind the Union Church in Falmouth, Virginia, which is just across the Route 1 bridge there. So he started his ironworks company, and it was a very big deal. It had an annual operating cost of 40,000 pounds a year. That's a sizable chunk of change when you're talking about uh, the 1750s. It was a very large structure. Uh, the main forge was 128 feet by 51 feet. It had eight coal forges and four trip hammers in it, an 80 by 40 coal house. He had a, a merchant mill, a grist mill, a sawmill, horse stables, a nailery, tannery, coopery, carpenter, and wheelwright shops, as well as houses for his managers and his workmen. It was a big to-do, big operation that he had going on. And the image you see here, uh, that was taken in the early 20th century, but that's actually excavated bars of pig iron uh, that was one of the exports coming out of his ironworks. And so as things are ramping up into the American Revolution, we're needing more firearms to be made in this country and you gotta make them out of iron and steel, so where do you go? Well, let's go to the guy who's got one of the largest iron manufacturing facilities in all of North America. I mean, think about that. It was right here, the largest one. And he starts what is called Rappahannock Forge because it's a forge and it's on the Rappahannock, right? Very, very creatively named. Uh, and so it opens in 1776. He secures a contract with the Continental Congress to be paid six pounds per gun. And his facility makes pistols, muskets, wall guns, bayonets, swords, kettles, spades, shovels, bits, and stirrups. And then some. Uh, he does a lot of stuff, but his firearms are really the cream of the crop. Uh, this is uh, the top picture is the top barrel flat on an incredibly elaborate Rappahannock Forge pistol that on all of his guns was abbreviated R-A-P, little a, Forge. So Rappa Forge, uh, as, as we refer to it uh, in the collector speak. And that particular gun uh, was an incredibly expensive firearm. Debbie mentioned in her presentation when John gives her a raise, maybe she'll start collecting guns. We all need a raise to collect that gun. That sold in 2017. Anyone want to guess how much? 100000 Close. $74,750. And that's not even the most expensive. There's one that's in the collection of the Fredericksburg Area Museum downtown that was purchased in 2007 for $107,000. They're incredibly expensive because they're incredibly rare. There are only 15 known Rappahannock Forge pistols left in existence. Uh, so with that comes big money. It's all about supply and demand. And the Rappahannock Forge pistols go for big bucks. 
the forge building itself was 350 feet long. It was four stories tall, and it had multiple purposes. Of course, it's built on the Rappahannock because they're using the waterworks in order to help power a lot of the machinery that he's dealing with. So the first floor, which is closest to the river, is powering the water machinery. The second floor is the main work area. The third floor is actually some extra housing because he's got a lot of people working in this facility uh, and they're storing parts that are in progress there. And then the fourth floor is where they're storing the, the finished product before it ends up, oh, how do I go back? The finished product before it goes out the door. Uh, and that is a close-up version of the stamping on one of the lock plates. So you can see the RAPA with the little A in Forge for, for Rappa Forge there. And they had a lot of workers and they were always looking for people to come in of a variety of different skills. And so they took out a lot of ads in the paper. A lot of ads in the paper. A lot <laughs> of ads in the paper. A lot, that's six of them just in under a year. Uh, that they were looking for. And it's interesting to note they were looking for uh, raw materials as well as people who have the ability uh, to create uh, uh, anchors and pots and kettles and uh, working uh, as artisans in the iron manufacturing facilities and people who know uh, how to do smelting and make shears and files in addition to everything else that they're making. Uh, and he's also got an incentive for you to come here and work for his forge. He's offering half acre lots in Fredericksburg and he'll also help front you the money to build your house so that you can come settle here and work in the forge. Unfortunately, it's not all happy in that regard. So he's going to offer you a half acre lot and you can come in and he'll help you get your house settled if you're a freeman. You see in one of the ads over here, Negro tradesmen in any of the above branches, also Coopers, would be preferred on purchase for ready money. And there are also a couple instances. They also took out ads looking for a couple runaway slaves, uh, offering a $30 reward for their return. I couldn't find any mention of, uh, of them ever getting that individual back at the forge. So the way Rappahannock Forge starts, uh, initially, William Fitzhugh, who owns Chatham Manor, which is across the river, uh, he provides the initial startup capital in order to get the guns and everything running. Uh, Mr. Hunter is wealthy and he's got the money, but it's tied up in his ironwork. So to be able to divert some of his resources to creating these guns, he needs a little bit of help. Uh, and Mr. Fitzhugh over at Chatham, he, he had the money and was able to do that. By 1777, Governor of Virginia, Patrick Henry, the give me liberty or give me death guy, he uh, offers official recognition of Rappahannock Forge. And then in 1781, there are actually two unsuccessful raids by the British to try to attack and take the forge because they knew it was such an integral part of the weapons manufacturing for the colonies, uh, which led to then Governor Thomas Jefferson to want to increase the security. Uh, he convinces Hunter to invest $180,000 in ramping up the security in the forge. Now, 1781, that's a big year. That's a good year. We win the revolution in October of 1781 at Yorktown, and so we're victorious, but we're broke as a country. And so Virginia cannot repay the $980,000 debt that they owe to James Hunter. And so, by 1782, the shop closes and it never reopens. That is the end of Rappahannock Forge. It has a very short life. Uh, the image here is one of the sabers that they made. And you'll notice on the hilt here, there's an H for Hunter. So his swords weren't labeled uh, Rappahannock Forge. They were labeled just a, an H. The next one we'll talk about is the Fredericksburg Gun Manufactory. And there are going to be some pictures of some houses in here because I am a historic preservation nerd. Uh, and so we've, we've got to throw the houses in where you can. Uh, so the gun manufactory was established July 17th, 1775. Uh, and it was approved to have a total construction budget of only 2,000 pounds. And there were five commissioners who were appointed to help start this facility. They are Fielding Lewis, who lived in... Kenmore, uh, the Kenmore Plantation, which is in downtown Fredericksburg. It's on Washington Avenue. 
Uh, it's a historic house museum now. You can tour there. I recommend it. I used to work there. Uh, and then the Charles Dick home. Uh, Charles Dick, his house is on Princess Anne Street. I believe the address is 1107. Uh, and it was for sale the entire time I was in school here. And it's finally been bought and it's being restored. And I think they're going to turn it into a bed and breakfast. But so his house is still there. Uh, so you can see two homes here in Fredericksburg that were the homes of individuals who were integral into creating firearms for our country in the revolution. The other individuals, William Fitzhugh, again, we'd mentioned him uh, as one of the individuals who helped with Rappahannock Forge. He was another one of them. Uh, Man Page, Man Page III, actually, uh, and he lived in a house called Mansfield, which is down, uh, down off Route 17. It no longer exists. And then Samuel Selden, and I took a picture out of a book because there are no photos of it. It was destroyed during the Civil War before uh, it was... Uh, before it was able to be photographed. So there are five of them total. These three individuals are mentioned in the initial founding document in 1775 and then never again. They basically kind of bailed. And it was Fielding Lewis and Charles Dick that were actually the ones who helped create the Fredericksburg gun manufactory. Uh, they leased a mill house on Hazel Run and bought 10 acres in town and eventually had a, a main manufactory, a powder magazine for creation and storage of powder, a cartridge works for the creation of rolled cartridges, and then, of course, repair shops for repairing of the guns and a vegetable garden for the workers that were living in the area. And Fredericksburg gun manufactory guns are labeled F-R-E-D with a little G, and then 1776 being the year that that particular gun was made. This is a great quote. This is Fielding Lewis writing to George Washington. And of course, Fielding Lewis is the brother-in-law of George Washington. He says, our gun manufactory is now beginning and expect by New Year's Day to have near 50 men employed who will make about 12 guns complete a day, as we are informed. We are now making locks to replace those Lord Dunmore took off the guns in the magazine. He's referring specifically to Lord Dunmore's forces who had gone down to the armory in Williamsburg, which was the capital, and had actually gone in, gotten access to the firearms, and removed the locks from the guns so that they were useless and all of the guns that were destroyed there in Williamsburg were sent up here to Fredericksburg to the gun manufactory to be repaired. That was their big business. So Lewis had big hopes with the production. They're hoping, you know, those, those 20 guns uh, or, or 12 guns a day, they never make it. In February of 76, they're only doing 10 a day. It gets worse by May of 77. They're only making 20 a week. It's two a day. Uh, no, uh, it's a handful a day, five a day. Uh, I do preservation because I'm not good at math. Um, so they, they didn't do well with the production. They were better with the repairs. As I said, all of the defective guns uh, from Williamsburg came here to Fredericksburg to be repaired. Uh, there's a better view of the lock plate there. That's a, a reproduction one. The manufactory never did as well uh, as, as Rappahannock Forge and, and Hunter did. They were always hard up for cash, uh, and it reaches a point that Fielding Lewis starts selling some of his property to help fund the operation. By 1780, he's owed 16,000 pounds, and he's essentially bankrupt. Uh, so he resigns as a commissioner because in addition to having poured his personal fortune into it, he's also got consumption or tuberculosis, and so he's incredibly sick at this point. So he leaves, and now Charles Dick is in charge uh, early 1781, the workers walk off the job over a pay dispute. But then, of course, October of 1781, uh, we have victory at Yorktown. Lewis dies in December, so he sees us win the revolution, um, but he never sees any of his money again. And uh, Charles Dick is able to keep the manufactory running for a little while, even after the war. But when he passes away in January of 1783, that's it. There's no one else to help run this place, and so operations finally cease on his uh, his operation there. So where are they now? I'm sure you you know we've talked about all of this stuff, but where was it? So of course, University of Mary Washington we've outlined there uh, in the center, but if you go north up across the river, that square that's up there, that is the chunk of land that was the Rappahannock Forge. Uh, it's right near Locks Island. Um, and it was for sale just a couple years ago. Uh, so we've got the Rappahannock Forge. 
uh, noted up there, it's private property. Um, it thankfully has not been developed upon. Uh, there are some, some small ruins that are still visible there, but nothing to, to really allude to the grandeur of what was there originally. And then the Fredericksburg Gun Manufactory is the little square down here at the bottom, uh, down near uh, Dixon Street and the Route 3 interchange off Lafayette Boulevard. It's now the Walker Grant Center, which was the Walker Grant School in the 30s. It was the first school in the area for African Americans. Uh, nothing of the original site remains there. Uh, there's a historic marker, and it's now a, an, an education center. Um, so nothing to let you know in, in any way that either of those places were incredibly instrumental in helping create the firearms that helped us win the revolution literally right here in your backyard. And so with that, uh, I know we've got a Q&A portion at the end, but there's always someone who has a burning question that they know they're going to forget unless they ask it right now. And heed the words of my father. There's no such thing as a stupid question, but there are stupid people who ask questions. Uh, but he, he never met all you fine folks. So uh, is there anyone that has a question that they, they need answered right now? Yes, ma'am. No, uh, the Rappahannock Forge is, is all private property. Well, and the Walker Grant Center is, is city-owned property. Uh, and and it, they frown upon you going in metal detecting there as well. So, yeah, my dad loves to do it too. And <laughs> uh, those are your words, not mine, my friend. <laughs> so. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, I hope this was enlightening. I hope you learned a little bit of something uh, that's right here in your backyard that you may or may not have known about. So appreciate you coming out, spending some time, uh, and learning a little bit. And we'll, oh, yes, Mike. No, uh, the Headquarters Museum does not have a Rappahannock Forge gun. Um, and even more rare than the Rappahannock Forge guns are the Fredericksburg Gun Manufactory pieces. Uh, there are only two in existence that I'm aware of. One uh, is in the Kenmore House Museum. They've got it in their, uh, in their uh, little lobby area. It's been heavily modified. It's been bored out to be a shotgun now, uh, and they cut the stock way down on it. Um, but that's the only one that's on public display. The other one is in a private collection. So there's only two. You know, I was able to give you price points on the Rappahannock Forge stuff. I can't on the FGM stuff because one's never come up for sale, <laughs> making them that rare. So, all right. Well, again, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me here.